Okay, welcome to the uh, investigative journal. Uh, called in a minute late, but anyway, uh, we're going to start the show today. My guest today, again, is Eric John Phelps. And the reason I'm having Eric on again is that uh, he's going to be on vacation for a little while, and I wanted to make sure that I get Eric on uh, one more time before, uh, before September in his scheduled appearance. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, how we can successfully successfully fight the Vatican-led New World Order and what we can do. But I did want to mention uh, <clears throat> I did want to mention a couple things. I wanted to say this that Eric has written a book called uh, well he's written three versions: Vatican Assassins One, Two, and Three. And the last one is over 1,500 pages. And some people may ask uh, why is it important to uh, write about the Jesuits and the Vatican? Well, last century. Uh, well, this is two centuries ago, a French writer named Adolphe Michel recalled that Voltaire estimated the number of works published over the years on the Jesuits to be about 6,000. And then another French writer asked, uh, well, how many have been written now? And he said this, it doesn't matter because so long as there are Jesuits, books will have to be written against them. There is nothing left to be said on their account, but new generations of readers come every day. And that's why Eric's book is important. Will these readers search old books? And this writer, uh, this French writer says this, the reason mentioned is that, uh, <clears throat> uh, in fact, most of the books retracing the history of the Jesuits cannot be found anymore. And they've been taken out by the Jesuits, taken out of uh, circulation. Only in public libraries can they still be consulted, which makes, which makes them out of reach for most readers. With the aim of succinctly informing the public at large in mind, a summary of these works uh, seemed necessary. And so uh, this writer went and talked about all the 6,000 books uh, that had been written about the Jesuits and how important it was to write about them. And I did want to mention this from Ed Edmund Paris's book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, uh, a French writer translated into English. He uh, says this, the public is practically unaware of the overwhelming responsibility carried by the Vatican and its Jesuits in the start of the two world wars, a situation which may be explained in part by the gigantic finances at the disposition of the Vatican and its Jesuits, giving them power in so many spheres, especially since the last uh, world war. In fact, the part they took in these most tragic events has hardly been mentioned until present time, except for apologists e eager to disguise it. It is with the, this aim of rectifying this and establishing true facts that we, the contemporary epic reader, acti activity which mutually concerns the, the Jesuits. And what he goes on to say, he begins to show so many different facts and people writing about the Jesuits. And what comes to mind before we get to Eric is how many people in our media have ignored this. I mean, when you start looking at all the people that have been writing about the Jesuits over the centuries, and for this to be ignored, especially the, the concordat that was brought together between the Nationalist Socialist government and the Vatican, how can these people uh, in, the, in the alternative media, like Alex Jones and the rest of these guys, ignore this? And how can the mainstream media ignore it? And I figured it's only one reason that they must be working for them, because how can they look at this? For example, Mr. Joseph Rovin, a Catholic writer, comments on the diplomatic agreement between the Vatican and the Nazi Reich on the 8th of July, 1933. And he writes, The concordat brought to the National Socialist government, considered nearly everywhere to be made up of usurpers, if not brigands, the seal of an agreement with the oldest international power, the Vatican. In a way, it was the equivalent of a diploma of international honorability. Thus, the Pope, not satisfied with giving his personal support to Hitler, which he did, granted in this way the moral support of the Vatican to the Nazi Reich. At the same time as the terror was beginning to reign on the other side of the Rhine and was tacitly accepted and approved, the so-called brown shirts had already put 40,000 persons into concentration camps. The, uh, the programs were multiplying to the accents of the Nazi march, when the Jewish blood stream streams from the knife, we feel better again. And that was said by a Nazi sympathizer. In the following years, Pius XII saw even worse without being stirred. It is not surprising 
that the Catholic heads of Germany vied with each other in their civility towards the Nazi regime, encouraged as they were uh, through their, by their Roman master. One must read the disheveled ra ravings and verbal acrobats of opportunist theologians such as Michael Schmoss. He was later made a prince of the church by Pius XII and described as the great theologian of Munich by the publication La Croix on the 2nd of September 1954. And as we look at these writings, we see the, the, the uh, agreement between the Vatican and all of its priests, all of its bishops, to support the Nazi Reich. And it goes on and on. And also, uh, never once did the Vatican ever denounce Third Reich. So what about the Fourth Reich, folks? Folks, what about the Fourth Reich led by the Vatican? Lessons from History of Roman Catholicism. Let me just read you this by Richard Bennett. Uh, and he writes this, and then we'll get to Mr. Phelps. The lesson and warning of history is that the undemocratic regimes whose leaders own allegiance to the Pope or practice the lofty principles of the papacy pose a threat to individual liberty and carry out religious persecution. For example, the Inquisition was alive and well in the Balkans in the 1940s. Convert or die was the choice on the 900,000 Orthodox Serbs in the new state of Croatia run by Nazi puppet Anton Pavlic and Roman Catholic primate Archbishop uh, Alois, Aloysius Stefanik. 200,000 of them were converted, and the other 700,000 who preferred to die were tortured, shot, burned, and buried alive. This appalling persecution carried out mainly by Eustachi priests and friars for the triumph of Christ in Croatia included many of the worst atrocities of the war. Certainly the mutilations were horrific, the savagery terrible. Few people know what took place in Croatia during the Second World War. News of it had been simply suppressed. And with that, I want to get to another thing. That's exactly what's happening today. The truth about the Jesuits and the Vatican and what's happening in our country is being suppressed. Being suppressed by the likes of people in the alternative media, and I can name their names, John Stadmiller and his radio station, uh, Jeff Rentz, the rest of these guys, the Alex Jones and GCN, who control most of the alternative media, and many other people have not given you the straight story. They've not researched history and will suppress this because they are protecting the Vatican so that this Inquisition can take place unabated in America. It's your life, folks. It's the life of your children. And if you're going to just fall for, you know, their ploys, you know what? You deserve what you get. And the mainstream media has proved to be a, a whore. So now has the alternative media. With that, I want to get to Eric Phelps. Eric, how are you? I'm doing well, Greg. Pleasure to be with you and your listeners. Yeah, and I wanted to bring that up for the first ten minutes of the show uh, to show how important it is. Over the years, there have been over 6,000 different books written about the Jesuits over the course of history. And what this French writer said is most of them have been suppressed. And that's why it's important for people like you to come forward and, and write again and to continue throughout, throughout history, to continue writing against them because they are just making it impossible for people to find the truth. Now, I know people in the media are smart as uh, uh, me or you, and they know the truth. They're just suppressing it. And I wanted to get your opinion about how important it is to continue this pursuit of exposing the people who are really, uh, uh, really hiding the Jesuit and Vatican evils in this, what I call the next fourth, the Fourth Reich. Yeah, you know, well, it's absolutely important because it's the Jesuits who rule the country. And uh, I have a quote in my book uh, by G. Gordon Liddy, who was trained by Jesuits at Fordham, and his father was very intimately involved with the Jesuits there. And the quote in his book that I quote in mine is, his book is Will, the autobiography of G. Gordon Liddy. He says in there that the Jesuits at Fordham rule the world and they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And G. Gordon Liddy knows who rules. And uh, so, so all these guys in Washington know who rules in the Beltway. And yet they're under oath or under death threats not to say anything. And so as a result, the people think, well, that in fact, there are two political parties and there really is a race and there really is an election, when that couldn't be any farther from the truth. So indeed, we need to continue to reveal the history of the Jesuits so that in the flow or in the stream of history, we're brought to the present 
and it makes perfect sense as to how they got this power and how they rule. Yeah, and that takes us to how they control the media. Just for a point, just to, last time you were on the show, we discussed this in depth, but I think it's worth mentioning just for a couple minutes again. And when you start looking at some of the past books uh, that have been written about the Jesuits and your book, which cites numerous, numerous uh, people throughout the course of history warning us about the Vatican and their evils, uh, even the Croatian, you know, the Croatian genocide uh in, the, in World War II, and uh, just as late as the genocide in Rwanda in the 90s. And what's so upsetting is that none of these people who profess to be in the alternative media, uh, who we talked about, will deal with these issues in a fact-by-fact basis. And I think the reason is, if they did, uh, their cover would be finally up. What's your thoughts? I agree completely, and they would not have a show anymore. I think the only one in the alternative media that ever really did deal with the Jesuits sincerely and persistently was William Cooper. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after they finished killing him, they felt that the main voice of exposing the Jesuits was gone. But uh, little did they know the Lord had other things in mind, that there would be a host of other people now that would rise up and expose them for what they are. But, uh, indeed, the Jesuit order, the, what I want to concentrate on when I have my newsletter going and uh, maybe even a broadcast with American Voice and thinking about it for an hour a week is to continually set forth the great authors of the past and what they wrote on the Jesuit order, what were the great statesmen of Europe, what they had to say about them, the leaders in World War II, what they had to say about them, and so that the reader may become very, very familiar with Jesuit history, and so that he's not surprised to see that all these Jesuit grads are manning key positions in the media, such as Chris Matthews, such as Tim Rissert, and uh, a host of others. So when you see the Jesuit connection there, the people that can know that they have an agenda. Yeah, and it not only not only stops with the media; it's also in our government and and in the the banking sector. In the and basically, if you look at some of their followers, it's amazing how much power they have. And it appears that they hide behind this one simple method, and that is to say, we are the sons of God. We are just a religious organization. And how dare you, how dare you criticize us? That's right. And you see, the reason why we can attack them is because we're taking their own writings, their own writings that they don't want you to know. For example, they, their key writers are called moral theologians, moral theologians. I call them immoral theologians. And some of their key defendants, uh, defenders, pardon me, a propagandist like Cardinal Bellarmine, Robert Bellarmine. He's a very important individual, a Jesuit and a cardinal of the 17th century. Uh, another particular uh, immoral theologian was Francisco Sarez. Francisco Sarez wrote the book on justifiable regicide, justifiable uh, murder of an enemy of the order. Uh, another immoral theologian, uh, uh, Emmanuel Sa, and Pablo Escobar. Um, the, the list is just unbelievable. Uh, but these immoral theologians that they call moral theology, in France, in the 1760s, this became known because of the uh, Lavalier, uh, with the Lavalier, um, Lavalier uh, issue where they banked, the Jesuits bankrupted a bank because of their speculation, and their constitution was pre- presented first time in the public arena. And there before a French court, that French court was so outraged when they read the absolute power of the Jesuit general and what he could do. And Laval yet had no business, uh, quote unquote, uh, speculating for the order. that They put it all on him uh, to make the order pay for the millions that had been lost. That the, je- that the French, uh, what would be our attorney general, uh, called for the absolute suppression of the Jesuits, which ultimately France did expel the Jesuits in 1764, and they took all the writings of their moral theologians, Sarez, Molina, Escobar, 
all of those men. They took them and they burned them on the public steps of the of the capital in Paris, France. A public burning of all their works, and then their open expulsion from France under Louis the Fifteenth. So this was this made all the papers all of Europe, and the colonies in America and in England. So none of this was ever done uh, in a corner, so the people didn't know about this. Uh, and there's instance after instance. Uh, Tsar Alexander the First does the same thing in 1820 after the Jesuits sought to uh, convert the nobles of Russia, of Tsarist Russia, to their cause, and seeking then to overthrow the Tsar. It was Tsar Alexander who in 1820 issued a royal case that said no more Jesuits in St. Petersburg and Moscow and no more Jesuits in all the Russias because they're constantly meddling in political affairs. It had nothing to do with their religion. It was their political meddling. And so the Jesuits remained expelled from Russia for over 100 years till Lenin uh, formally allowed them to come back into Russia in 1922, showing you, in fact, who really controlled the Bolshevik Revolution. So there are instances after instances. Here's another instance. Uh, Eugene Sue. Eugene Sue was one of the greatest Frenchmen who ever lived in my book. He was a physician. He was a mariner. He was learned. He spoke several languages. And he wrote the most wonderful expose on the Jesuit order. He's probably regarded as the third greatest enemy of the Jesuit order in history. The first being Blaise Pascal and his provincial letters. The second being um, in the, um, uh, Dostoevsky with his uh, brothers Karamazov and his the Grand Inquisitor. And the third being Eugene Sue. And when Eugene Sue wrote The Wandering Jew in, in 1844, and this hit Europe all the Europeans realized that the Jesuits were running their countries, that they were the masters of murder and deception and pillage and, and extortion and you name it, centralizing all monetary power, political power. And that was one of the things that was used to excite the European nations to the second French Revolution of 1848. Um, we have Westward Ho, written by Kingsley, who was the confessor or the, the chaplain to Queen, Queen, uh, to Queen Mary to Queen Victoria. Westward Ho further exposes it. You have Voltaire and his Candide. Let us eat Jesuits. Uh, it's one particular piece of great literature after another, which, by the way, we are not allowed to read in our college literature courses, that further exposes the order in all their devices. So we need to go back to the literature and the writings of the 1900s and early 20th, 20th century. Yeah, and I mean, I'm just looking at some things in World War II here uh, be, uh, regarding the Vatican and the Jesuit role in uh, the Holocaust and the monstrosities that took place in, uh, uh, in World War II. Carlo Falcone uh, wrote a book, The Silence of Pope Pius XII, wrote it in, I believe in French, but he's an Italian, and he said the existence of such monstrosities overthrows every standard of good and evil. They defy dignity of their individual being and society in general to such an extent that we are compelled to denounce those who have, could have influenced public opinion, be they ordinary civilians or heads of state. And what he's talking about, to keep quiet in the face of such outrages, he's talking about the Vatican, would amount, in fact, to downright collaboration. It would stimulate the villainy of the criminals, stirring up their cruelty and vanity. But if every man has the moral duty to react when confronted with such crimes, it is doubly so of the religious societies in their heads, including Pope Pius XII, who said nothing, and above all, the head of the Catholic Church. And so we not only show silence, then we get to complicity. And that was brought out in another book, where it actually showed that the Vatican had used Monsignor Stepanek to work with Anton Pavlicek, Pavlicek, who was the mass murderer for the Ustashi, and it's documented. Then we go, there's a very concise book by Gunther Louis. It's written in 64 called The Catholic Church in Nazi Germany, and he says that all the documents agree to show the Catholic Church cooperating with the Hitler regime. <laughs> That's exactly now, right. There is no Adolf Hitler without Pacelli. You have to remember that Adolf Hitler was an Austrian. He was not a German. He only received German citizenship in 1932, the year before he became chancellor. 
He was a he was a flop house drunk. He never read a book. All he ever did was read newspapers. His one room little ap apartment there in Vienna um, contained old newspapers. He was totally incapable of writing Mein Kampf, so which is why Louis Le Louis Le um, Leo Lehman, in his great book Behind the Dictators, says that the Jesuits wrote Mein Kampf, and their whole geopolitical pattern for Europe is dictated by Karl Haushofer, who was another Jesuit. Hitler followed it to a T when he subjugated Austria and then Czechoslovakia and then attacked Poland. But no, mm -hmm. Hitler was nothing. He was, a, he was nothing. He was just a crusader to preach the crusade against the Jews of Europe. And so, therefore, it was Eugenio Pacelli who had been personally tutored by the Jesuits. The Jesuit general, uh, Francis Xavier Warnes, was his uh, tutor, uh, in Rome, and uh, Warrens was had a hand in the writing of the Code of Canon Law for 1917. And Pacelli had been taught hatred of the Jews from the time he was a little boy, and he was most devoted to the Jesuits, Virgin Mary. Um, it just goes on and on. And Pascalina, uh, um, went to, who wrote the book on Adolf Hitler, she wrote uh, uh, La Popessa, and in that book it tells that Hitler visited Pacelli, who was the uh, Nuncio there in Bavaria, and he visited him, and Pacelli gave him a sack of money, and he said, go fight the crusade against communism, essentially. So, and without Pacelli, who then goes back to be Secretary of State, who then becomes Pope in 1939, without him, there is no Adolf Hitler. Uh, Cornwall should have never wrote the book Hitler's Pope. It should have, uh, the book should have been called The Pope's Fuhrer. That's the proper title. Uh, so, no, it, you just go on and on and on as you find these things. And then you, after the war, you have key, four key Jesuits who are involved in the cover of, of the Pope in the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust. And three of those Jesuits were, were uh, Blep, and one of them was Robert Graham, an American Jesuit, and uh, Robert Lebeer, who had been the Pope's confessor. All these four key Jesuits, and I named them in my book, were involved in suppressing the evidence of the papacy under Pius XII being the mainspring of the whole Third Reich and the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust, not only of the Jews, but also of the German Lutherans, because we have to remember Prussia was destroyed in World War II. Protestant Prussia was finished. Hitler and Stalin worked together to destroy the Protestant Prussian people. And we have the destruction of the of 200, what, 20 million Orthodox people. And the Orthodox people have been condemned by canon law. So the Jesuits are, are wonderfully and unbelievably orchestrating the dictators of Europe together, allied in Axis together, in the annihilation of the certain peoples they wanted to destroy, as well as in the establishment of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. <laughs> exactly. Before we get to more uh, uh, pertinent things that are going on in our world today, uh, I wanted to mention... Well, so many things are forgotten, but there was a speech by a member of the parliament for uh, uh, Livorne at Meda at Ortona on the 15th of April, 1946. And Laura Diaz, who was a member of parliament, said this. She said, the Pope's hands are dripping with blood. And then students at Cardiff University, Cardiff University College, chose a theme for a conference, and this was April 2nd, 1946, should the Pope be brought to trial as a war criminal? And I, the, question, the answer is absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and here's what's so interesting, though, and let me read this really quickly. Here's how John, Pope John XXIII expressed himself when referring to the Jesuits. This is after all these facts and information comes out implicating the Vatican, implicating Pope Pius XII with the Nazi war crimes. He says, persevere, dear son, Jesuits, in the activities which have already brought you well-known merits. In that way, you will gladden the church and will grow with an untiring uh, ardor. The path of your path is just, is, is, is as just as the light of dawn. May that light grow and illuminate the molding of all adolescents, and that way you will help carry out our spiritual wishes and concern. We give our apostolic blessing with all our heart to your superior general, to you and your coagitators, and to all members of the Society of Jesus. And then, uh, when was this? Uh, recent, just right after that, Pedro Arupi, 
Father Arupi was named Jesuit general. Um, so that's how they view this whole thing. Um, well, well, we have to remember, Greg, that the no. Jesuits have done only what they've said they were going to do. You have to give the devil his due. The Jesuits, in their, in their documents of law, in their documents setting forth what they seek to establish and fulfill, which they don't want the public to read, they have done exactly what they said they will do, and for that I respect them. And just when I read that, was to show the hypocrisy of the Pope in the Catholic Church, because how can a man in the highest position of, a, of the Catholic Church uh, express uh, this loyalty and this uh, adoration for the Jesuits after they've been involved in the most horrendous of genocides. Because this is why. This is why. Yeah. It, according to the doctrines of, of Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica, it is no murder to kill a heretic. We have to understand that. And without the shedding of the blood of the heretic, there is no salvation. These are doctrines of Aquinas that the Jesuits have championed and put into their moral theologies and into their Jesuit oath. So the Jesuit, after 15 years of education and brainwash by his superiors, is in the hands of his superior as a stick in the hand of an old man, as described by Loyola. And so when they're given the order to kill, assassinate, uh, defraud, uh, become involved in graft or whatever, they carry out the order without fear of, re of reprisal and without conscience and do exactly as they are told. They are the perfect Manchurian candidates and wherever they are in their secret places upon the order of their superior, they immediate come out of, immediately come out of their holes and do their bidding, do the work that they've been told to do. Just as if you ever saw the movie Brotherhood of the Bell, when Glenn Ford is given an order to do something, it's absolute and complete and total obedience, which was the maximum of the SS. And so this is how the Jesuits function, and it goes all back to their theologies. Right. And, you know, the most important thing I think your book, your Vatican Assassin's Three, does is it brings all these facts to the forefront. And then it also shows who's willing to discuss it, in a, in a logical manner to try to get to the problems going facing our country, facing Europe, and then it shows the people who are hiding it. Because never once did I ever hear you say, believe, you know, believe, just read what I'm saying, put it out there, never forcing anybody, but just to, just to look at the material. And that in itself, you know, the people that don't want to even look at it, that just 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 write it off and say, oh, this is just all baloney, shows exactly how corrupted they are. We'll get back, because I want to talk about the EU and other things that the Jesuits are doing overseas. We'll be back after these short messages. And uh, I want to thank Liberty Radio. Ah, here we are. Okay, we're back, and I wanted to thank Liberty Radio for running that, and it really shows where we've, we've come from 63 with uh, Kennedy and then uh, what our president is saying now. And I, I think I know why I cried, Eric, when I was a little boy when Kennedy was killed. It seems to me he was talking about the Jesuits. That's right. <laughs> he knew the Jesuits I, well. He had been yeah. trained by them. He knew them at Georgetown when he moved into Georgetown. He had attended Georgetown for some time along with Jackie. He went to their Jesuit church there in Washington, D.C. He knew them like the back of his hand. His parents attended Xavier Church there in uh, uh, where they have their um, well, their, their cottage uh, in Massachusetts. What they're called, uh, I can't remember at the moment. But he, they were part of his family life. And yet he knew exactly the power of his father and his relationship to Spelman. He knew his father had caused the Great Depression. And uh, his father was the most powerful knight of malt in the country at the time before his stroke. And so he knew. And he made a conscious decision to resist them. And what he just described in this preceding tape that we all heard 
is he's describing the Jesuit order to the T because there's no such organization that can encompass such a vast array of sciences and strongholds as the Jesuit order. The Jews pale in comparison to them. Yeah, yeah. And I know you've written a lot about the Kennedy assassination, and we'll save that for another show. But I also, one argument that people make uh, who don't want to accept or even start researching the Vatican's involvement, because I believe firmly that if we don't stop these people or expose them, America has no hope. Uh, it's that serious. And uh, one of their arguments is that, well, the Vatican may have been like that in the future, but, you know, in the in past. The past. Yeah, in the past, but they're not like that now. And I wanted to read something and then get your opinion on that. But this, by Pope John the 23rd, about the Jesuits shows they haven't changed. And although he uses words like God and honorable, try to read between the lines. He says, from the time of its restoration, this Jesuit religious family enjoys the sweet help of God and has enriched herself very quickly with great progress. The members of the Society of Jesus have accomplished many important deeds, all to the glory of God and for the benefit of the Catholic religion. The Church needs soldiers of Christ with valor, armed with a dauntless faith, ready to confront difficulties. That is why we have a great hope in, in the help you activity will bring us. May the new era, now listen to this, may the new era find the Society of Jesus on the same path it trod in the past. <laughs> now yeah. that was given on August 20, 64. So how can anybody say their ideas have changed? That's right. No, they oh. haven't changed. And in fact, in the days during just prior to their suppression, in France, Louis the Fifteenth, Louis the Fifteenth said to Jesuit General Lorenzo Ricci, he says, "Can't you just change the order or change the maxims?" And Ricci very boldly said, "Let them be as they are, or else not be." And that has become a battle cry for the Jesuits. Let us be as we are or else not be. They never change. Their designs never change. Their goal of world government never changes. In fact, uh, one of my uh, fellow researchers just happened to come across a, a very rare French book written in French that I would like to have translated someday. It's called The Kingdom of Solipsis. And in, in that great work, it was written by a Jesuit, a renegade Jesuit, Jesuit, who showed that the purpose of the Jesuit order was to establish a world government, a kingdom of Solipsis. Mm -hmm. And um, he was, he had to go into hiding, and from what I'd read, he'd been knifed, and so they had tried to kill him, but the book managed to get out and become circulated in Europe at the time, about the time of Eugene Sue's work. But uh, they, they don't change, they're the same. And, of course, Pope... Uh, uh, John the Twenty Third, uh, he had been involved in the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust. He was a, what, an Archbishop, I believe, out of Turkey at the time, coordinating with Turkey, and uh, he he um, he too was assassinated by them because he crossed them. And I cover that in my book. Uh, so no Pope has any guts to truly resist the Jesuit order. And if the Pope has no guts to resist them. Why should we expect any Roman Catholic priest, archbishop, or cardinal, or any Roman Catholic politician of any stripe to resist them? None of them will, because now those Roman Catholic politicians and others in the know know that the Jesuit general controls the international intelligence community. They are all combined. They all work together hand-in-hand -in -hand with the international crime syndicate out of Sicily, and so between those two international families with an excess of probably 5,000 assassins, uh, nobody with, with, any, with any lack of faith is going to cross them. And that's where we are today. You know, and I wonder if Kennedy, just on that, just uh, adding something, uh, I wonder if Kennedy understood how serious, how in danger he was when he gave that speech. Of course he did. Or, I have a quote from Tim for Jones, Jr., in uh, one of the four books he wrote on uh, Forgive My Grief, and there's a quote right in there that's taken from Kennedy's secretary that she said, he said, they can get me, if, if they want to get me, they can get me even in church. That's what he said. So he had determined that he was going to die. 
But he set out, and he refused to go along with it, and he sought to break their power. And it was very intriguing that nobody came to his aid or rescue, nobody of any race, of any religion, including Billy Graham, the 33rd degree Freemason. He knows all about the Jesuit Kennedy assassination. Yet do you think he'd say a word? All, we have been completely betrayed from the pulpit to the statesman, to the academian, to the art artist. They have betrayed us, and so therefore we have to go back and dig up these works and start over again. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it was interesting, if you look at some of Kennedy's, the, the changes he made, he was hitting uh, he was hitting them right where it hurts, so, so to speak, and that means in the Federal Reserve he wanted to get rid of, he wanted to completely abolish uh, the Black Pope's uh, international network of uh, the CIA, the KGB, the Mossad, all working together at high level, and uh, uh, also wanted to expose the secret societies. Uh, so, I mean, he was, he was really... Uh, what, you know, things and he was against the mafia, right? Too. Right. There was there wasn't any enemy he did not engage, and uh -huh. uh, and, and every Baptist preacher, every true Protestant preacher should have united behind him and gave him all kinds of moral support and took took those very same messages to the pulpit. And he's absolutely right in what he says. Can a Roman Catholic say something true? Can a Roman Catholic say something right? Of course they can. And so, therefore, it should have been repeated in all these pulpits that JFK, although we feared for him, for our, our concerns that he's a Roman Catholic, he's obviously repudiated the temple power of the Pope. He doesn't allow Spellman in the White House. He doesn't allow Spellman to say Mass in the White House. He refuses Spellman any access to the CIA. He, he completely broke the back of what Eisenhower had created. Right. And... Uh... Thus, he was killed. And that was immediately put back in place by that coadjutor, Lyndon Baines Johnson, that mm. Freemason out of Texas, whose, whose greatest friend was Warnerball Snyder, a Catholic priest out of uh, uh, Stonewall, Texas, who was at the OBJ's funeral with Billy Graham. I have a picture in my book of them both. Right. You know, I wanted to get into something here real quick in this last uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then we have another hour to discuss uh, the topic I wanted to, and that is what can we do to solve this problem. But I wanted to uh, talk about the European Union. Now, the Va uh, people don't know that the Vatican, well, they may know, the tax-exempt status in Italy has made it possible for uh, the Vatican to manipulate financially may many of the largest uh, multinational corporations. Uh, but uh, the powerful influence is nothing when compared with the Vatican's power in the world of European politics and religion. A Jesuit priest uh, said this, he said, uh, when he wrote Inside the Vatican, he said, despite the importance of the papacy for the Catholic Church and its prominent role in international affairs, its internal workings are little known to Catholics, to world leaders, or to uh, the world at large. This general lack of public awareness is particularly noticeable with regard to the influential role the Vatican has long been maintaining in connection with the development of the European Union, which will, uh, their plans then are to create the American Union uh, of uh, Mexico, Canada, and America. Uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about, you know, this is just another, what I consider, uh, the New World Order led by the Vatican uh, taking control of uh, Europe and then America right after. What are your thoughts? That's absolutely right. As I cover my book... I cover the Second Thirty Years' War. Remember the Jesuits started the First Thirty Years' War in 1618, and it lasted until 1648. And at the end of that war, and all modern historians will tell you, begins the modern era, when inventions begin to take off, and the middle class begins to be created, and national sovereignties begin to be established, and the temporal power of the Pope is broken in northern European nations. I mean, this is a very important date of 1648. And so what the Jesuits did is, uh, in, in 1914, they started their second 30 Years' War. And it raged from to 1945. And in that second 30 Years' War, they eliminated uh, the nations and the leaders of those nations who had been their enemies for over 100 years. And so after they had eliminated Protestant Prussia and they had destroyed the British Empire with German U-boat submarines, destroying over 600 ships that linked the, linked the uh, Protestant British Empire together. 
After they had destroyed the Russian Empire and the Romanov dynasty that was a protector of the heretic and liberal Russian Orthodox Church, after they had destroyed the perfidious quote-unquote Jews out of Europe by first confining them to the Pale of Settlement and then using Stalin and Hitler to kill them off from both directions because, you know, Jews were not allowed to retreat into Russia, which totally destroys the argument that Jews ran Russia. If they did, they would have allowed all the Jews to flee from Poland into Russia. But they were in no man's land. They were forbidden to flee because they were in this pincer between Stalin and Hitler. So after the, uh, all financed, by the way, by Henry Ford and other huge cartel capitalists out of New York City and London, financing both sides. So after World War II, then, they, the Jesuits then helped their greatest Nazis to escape out of their rat lines, and they merged the, the NKVD and the OSS into new agencies using the, the uh, old masters of the SS and the SD. Uh, a portion of them went into each intelligence agency. And so they were busy creating the international intelligence community during the Cold War under the false pretense that we can have thermonuclear war, airborne nuclear war, which I have said many times, isn't, there's no proof of mutually assured destruction and airborne nuclear war. There is no proof for that. And so therefore they put this Cold War upon us, and what happens? It's called the violent peace. The CIA commits 10 million murders during the time of the Cold War, according to what uh, John Stockman, who was one of the first... Uh, defectors out of the CIA, and he tells the truth. And so they're busy using their intelligence agencies to further kill off the leaders of nations because they cannot allow any national sovereignty to exist in any nation. We must destroy their political leaders. We must destroy their racial identities. We must destroy their language. We must mix the languages. We must destroy their historic cultures. And so they were busy doing this during the Cold War. And so now what we have is, is the Jesuits now destroying what was once white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Northern Europe and white Anglo-Saxon Protestant North America and also white Anglo-Saxon Protestant South Africa and Zimbabwe. So they're busy finishing off these last bastions of the greatest resistors to their temporal power. And in the North America here, they're busy merging uh, Roman Catholic Mexico, which has been destroyed thanks to NAFTA and GATT, uh, via Bill Clinton and Lee Iacocca, Knight of Malta, Iacocca, Kennedy assassin. And they're busy uh, 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 creating their I-35 highway, which will be the 69, I-69 corridor, for the purpose of our invaders when they come up into North America. So the Jesuits, for the, the plans for the 21st century is to completely destroy what is left of the Protestant Reformation, including the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, any real freedoms that we've had, and bring the world under international Jesuit fascism with the, the, the pillars of communism controlling. Vitally important, I think, if the nations of Europe and America remain, remain free, then we have to wake up to what they're doing both in, in Europe right now and tackle this critical issue of Rome. And right. it's just so depressing that this country, the supposed leader of freedom, which we know is a falsehood, uh, stands probably is the only one that could possibly stand in the way, and we have been sold out by the most important branch, and that's our media, who could alert people to this. And they are not doing it, and they're collecting money, going to the bank, while this country will slowly uh, fall into the hands of uh, Rome and the Jesuits. Sure. Um, we have right? to remember that America, this this what we call America, has been in the hands of the Vatican since certainly no later than Grover Cleveland, uh, especially with the Kennedy assassination when the Jesuits killed Kennedy. But from 1901, the fascist symbol of the fascists began to be displayed in the House of Representatives. I saw it there when FDR declared war, like when the Congress declared war in 1941, those fascist symbols were there in the House. So we have had, in fact, de facto fascism in a in a American empire created by this 14th Amendment, and this empire with its Federal Reserve Bank and its vast uh, resources and, and men, this tremendous military power that's been built and financed by the Federal Reserve Bank, has been used to just restore the Pope's temple power around the world and to kill heretics and liberals around the world for the last 100 years. And this is merely a continuation in Iraq of what's been done since the days of the Spanish-American War. So for this to change, American people are going to have to realize 
that our country has been taken over, and it has been taken over, for over 100 years, and they have to start moving to resolve the problem. One of the first things is, uh, humanly speaking, is the Jesuits have to be expelled from this country, and it has to be done by way of the government. That means the Jesuits have to be broken of their death grip over the Justice Department. In fact, when you go into the Justice Department of Washington, D.C., there's a fence there and as a gate, and as those gates open on each, on the, out, uh, on the inner ends of those gates, as it opens together, are the symbol of a Roman fascist, a bundle of rods with an axe protruding at the top. The Justice Department is fascist, and it's run by the Jesuits and will protect them, and they will never be expelled unless the Justice Department is taken back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the Church of Rome is one of the major players in this totalitarianism, uh, totalitarianism of the New World Order. And just look at what they've done in Europe. And this is the unfolding of the major global strategy. And you're seeing the Fourth Reich now, I think, emerge out of its embryo, uh, is the way I look at this happening here now. And it's about time Americans realize uh that this government has sold out. So to get to get to that point where the government expels the Jesuits, we got a job to do to get the right people in government again. That's right. And there are those that seem to be right, like Ron Paul. I mean, he advocates the doing away with the socialist communist income tax, which is a violation of our Fifth Amendment right, uh, trying to compel us to make admissions and confessions on a tax return every year, which is typical... Roman, because you see, the Jesuits have designed this government of the empire precisely as they run their Vatican Empire, uh, because uh, every Roman Catholic is supposed to go to confession once a year. Well, now, every citizen of the 14th Amendment is supposed to go to confession every year, and it's called filing a tax return. They've patterned it perfectly as they run the Vatican Empire pursuant to canon law. So when Americans begin to wake up and realize it's the Vatican that's taken over, that the Archbishop of New York is really the president, the king of this empire, and there is no political individual who will dare disobey him because they all cow, uh, cower at his feet there in St. Patrick's Cathedral hoping for his blessing that they can be in some kind of governmental position. The other thing is the Jesuits with their 28 universities, their graduates go into every facet of life, sports, entertainment, politics, law, medicine, you, uh, uh, inventions. The Jesuits are the gatekeepers of the patent office. Anybody who comes out with an anti-gravity craft that can actually fly uh, on an alternative fuel and be anti-gravity, it's all stifled because the Jesuits run the patent office and they will not grant a patent for that because they control all that technology and they don't want us, us uh, goofballs, us animals, to be able to enjoy the technology they enjoy. So when we begin to wake up to their absolute dictatorial control, but we are nothing more than Federal Reserve people. That's all we are. The Jesuits look at us, and everybody they see, they say they're ours, they belong to us, they're all in commerce, they're all trading a commercial paper, they all get their loans from our credit, from the Federal Reserve, their government is, it's very lifeblood, is dependent on our loans from the Federal Reserve. Americans are nothing more than Federal Reserve people. They own nothing, they have nothing, and they're all broke. They all think they own something, but they don't. So that's how the Jesuits look at us, and therefore, since we own these people, since we own their bank, since we own the clothes on their back, why can't we draft them and send them off to our crusades to kill people that we want to have killed and might as well kill some of them, too, while we're at it? Like, for example, the invasion of Omaha Beach, when it was primarily Protestants that were put on the Omaha Beach, and they deliberately bombed the ocean, and they bombed behind the lines so that the majority of those American soldiers could be whacked by the German machine gunners. I mean, this is the kind of things they do. That's why they want to know your, your uh, dog tag. What's your religion on your dog tag so they know where to send you? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a conspiracy so large, as J. Edgar Hoover said in 1954, that it boggles your mind, and we need to begin to wake up and not call it a conspiracy theory. This is reality because this is exactly what Jesuit canon law and the moral theologians have called for. Yeah, and I mean, well, all we have to do is look at Iraq today. Over a million Iraqis killed. And is it a million now, Greg? Yeah. Terrible. That's what I've heard. I, we said it would be a war of annihilation. Yeah. We knew it was going to be a war of annihilation as soon as they went over there. And you know what I've also found? The only guys, the only soldiers that came out against this were two black soldiers. 
I haven't seen any white soldiers come out and say anything. Now, about one black soldier that was on for a day before they yanked him off, that Eric, what was his name? And yeah, there was Karen, another no. guy in uh, Rousseau's work from Freedom of Fashion. He was a black fellow Marine. He said, I'm not going back there to kill any more poor people. I haven't seen one white soldier to refuse to go back to Iraq, but we're, just, we're committing annihilation over there. But hopefully someone will not disappoint us and come out and tell us we're not going back either. It's a war of annihilation. And, yeah, I mean, it's so obvious that they're using our youth to kill off the Iraqis. And uh, this is not going to end. I mean, this is just the beginning of what their plans are, no matter what the government tells you to pacify you. Oh, we may remove the troops next year mm -hmm. and lower the number, uh, but we have to get our, we have to look at the final, uh, you know, analysis from our generals. Uh you know, I just, I just think America, and, and then to see the lackluster, uh, the lackluster uh, resistance put up now any, everywhere in this country, it makes me wonder if the American people aren't just resigned to what's happening and say, well, we can't do anything, what can we do? You know, that, I wonder about that. What's your thoughts? I think there's much truth to that. Look at the, look at the attitude they take towards filing the income tax return. I've never met anybody who wants to do it. I met many people that say I have to waive my Fifth Amendment right to do it, but you know what? The vast majority of the World War II generation, the baby boomers, they all went along with it. They all became, had fear and terror of the Internal Revenue Service. And you know what? Now there's something a lot more terrifying than those centers, and that is the Department of Homeland Security. When those monsters are unleashed upon us after we get our next 9/11 event, and after Mecca and Medina are blown. They'll make the IRS and the BATF and, and all these other alphabet agencies seem like uh, Boy Scouts. Because we didn't resist our invaders at our doorstep, now we will have to resist them at our hearth. And that's always a much more dangerous place than at the doorstep. But yes, you're right. The American people have resigned themselves to this, and hopefully the Lord would send a revival as certain of God's men would begin to preach the true gospel and return to the King James Bible and people would have uh, courage and faith once again to resist even though the odds, quote-unquote, are against them. Yeah, and then I love people who say, well, when, once you get into the religious aspect of this, so many Americans have become so apathetic to even the thought that religion could be playing a part in this, and uh, the Vatican could be using it as a deception as they have over the centuries. And I think that that is another key element here that we must start exposing uh, the Vatican as well as other uh, religious people for who, what they really are. Absolutely. And I put it in quotes, call themselves religious. And then the apathetic Americans saying, oh, they can't even be involved in this. It's, just, it's a perfect plan they've got set up. We've got to break it. We'll be back after this short message. I was crying, lost in the lost world. Journal today. I'm your host, uh, Greg Szymanski, and I'll be here for the next hour. And I'm here every day on LibertyRadioLive.com uh, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. And also, you can go and look at my website at www.arcticbeacon.com, and you can read about the Jesuits and many other things. Uh, uh, that we talk about on this radio program. Uh, and I also recommend you go to uh, uh, Vatican Assassins, and I believe that's .org, right? VaticanAssassins.org? Yes. Org. yes. Uh, and you can get a lot of Eric's writings and also a copy of his uh, latest 1,500-plus uh, page book, Vatican Assassins Three, And it's well worth reading uh, for the reasons that we've stated uh, many times on this show. And I wanted to get something, make something clear to my listeners. Uh, this is not a show, a potpourri of uh, interviews done daily uh, to entertain you or to uh, awaken you about the latest uh, little piece of minutia about 9-11 or the little piece of minutia about uh, when the government is going to attack again, like many other shows do. Uh, <clears throat> in the past, I've whittled down my message to this very important message, and that is, the Vatican-led New World Order in all its tentacles. 
and I do it for a reason, because I wanted it to be an educational program uh, based on the fact that no one's covering this anywhere. The guests that I bring on, like Eric Phelps, are, are left to uh, uh, talk in a very small market where they should be in a very large market. And some of my critics have said, well, Greg, why don't you talk about some other things? And I said, I will talk about other things once you put my guests on the major networks, once Alex Jones and the major, and John Statmore put all these guests on, and they're on on a basis equal to how they blame the Jews, how they blame the geopolitical banking organizations. And once there's an equality there, I promise I'll do other things. But until that day happens, I won't. Because there's no one that needs to be told, and the message needs to get out, and it needs to be done in a repetitive manner if these other organizations are hiding it and actually bringing down this country, and it's going to lead to your demise, folks. Uh, that I'm sure of, and I've learned that by just talking to all the people and reading all the, all the hidden stuff that I could not believe. And I say also to my critics, I say, you know what, I lived over there for six years. I lived with these people, although I was quite naive back in 1979 through 85. I saw what they did in Italy. I saw the scandals, and now I put the pieces together. And with that personal experience, together with the factual information that's come out, to me, uh, this message is not going to stop until uh, these other people start covering it which they may never do because they might be on the payroll, or I can get an interview with Father Hans Kolbenbach, who I've tried to do, and he won't talk to me. And that's the leader of the Jesuits, and I figured, why not? I'm a Catholic boy. Why can't he talk to me? He's a priest. If I have some doubts, Father, tell me about it. Talk to me. You know, I have a law degree. I can sit and talk with you intelligently, but he won't speak to me. I've tried. I've went all the way up to the Washington Assistancy to get an interview, and I'm going to start trying again and rattle their chains a little bit more. But these guys, Eric, do not want to talk about facts. No. You understand? You, you know what have I'm penetrated their armor by becoming familiar with their doctrines and their true history, and that they will not talk with anybody about outside of their order. But here's something I'd like to read to you. It's a quote from Eugene Sue. I recommend the reader, readers find the book. Okay, go ahead. The Wandering Jew, it's in two volumes, and you need to get an older volume because the new ones have been censored. But here we read in volume one on page 312, 313 and following, quote, and this is a Jesuit who is speaking, what ought not to be sacrificed in order to reign in secret over the all-powerful of the earth who lord it in full day? This journey to Rome from which I have just returned has given me a new idea of our formidable power. For it is Rome, which is the culminating point, overlooking the fairest and broadest quarters of the globe, made so by custom, by tradition, or by faith. Thence can our workings be embraced in their full extent. It is an uncommon view to see from its height the myriad tools whose personality is continually absorbed into the immovable personality of our order. What a might we possess! Verily, I am always swayed with admiration, I almost frightened, that man once thinks, wishes, believes, and acts as he alone lists, until, soon ours, he becomes but a human shell. Its kernel of intelligence, mind, reason, conscience, and free will, shriveled within him, dry and withered by the habit of mutely, fearingly bowing under mysterious tasks which shatter and slay everything spontaneous in the human soul. Then do we infuse in such spiritless clay, speechless, cold, and motionless as corpses, the breath of our order, and lo, the dry bones stand up and walk, acting and executing, though only within the limits which are circled round them evermore. Thus do they become mere limbs of the gigantic trunk, whose impulses they mechanically carry out, while ignorant of the design, like the stone cutter who shapes out a stone, unaware if it be for cathedral or bagnio, brothel. But now, in spite of the misfortunes which have befallen the order, that's 1848, I feel myself a thousand times more ready for action, more authoritative, more strong and more daring at the head of our mute and black-robed militia, 
who only think or wish or move and obey mechanically according to my will. On a sign they scatter over the face of the globe, gliding stealthily into households under the guise of confessing the wife or teaching the children, into family affairs by hearing the dying of owls, up to the throne through the quaking conscience of a credulous crowned coward, aye, even to the chair of the Pope himself, living manifesto of a Godhead though he is, by the services rendered him or imposed by him. Is not this secret rule made to kindle or glut the wildest ambition as it reaches from the cradle to the grave, from the laborer's hovel to the royal palace, from the palace to the papal chair, unquote? That's Eugene Sue in his masterpiece, The Wandering Jew, which is really a suppressed book these days and not read in any major college literature course. Hmm. Yeah, powerful words. Uh, by the way, Eugene Su, because of this, because of his work, when, uh, uh, when in 1848, uh, 1852, when there was a coup d'etat and Napoleon III became emperor, he was driven from France and never allowed to return and died in exile. Hmm. Unbelievable. And uh, these are kind of things that you're not going to get, uh, I mean... Uh, one of the most interesting things is the Jesuits call themselves the great educators, but uh, I think their major role is to keep to keep the books on the shelf they want you to read and to take off the books that uh, they don't want you to read. And many of them have to do with criticisms and facts about their history. Uh, and I, you know, one thing I asked I asked a number of Jesuits in these uh, assistancies. I'd call them, and I remember talking to a couple of their historians. And I started reeling off some of these books, and they said they had no idea about them, that this was ever written about the Jesuits. And I find that unbelievable. Right. If I can find it, how can a historian that's been trained for 14 years in the Jesuit order not know about them? Exactly right. And they're very familiar with the priests who have left the order or the priests who have left Catholicism. And they're very familiar with their books, like Father Chenequis, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. I have another one here called... Uh, Dialogues, uh, dealings with the Inquisition by um, Dr. Achille, who was a priest. We have uh, uh, Papal Rome. We have another one here, the, the Kingdom of Solipsis, England. And, you know, they're all Catholic priests who left the order. They fled to England where they could have protection there because it was a Protestant nation. And then they wrote all their works. You have G.B. Nicolini writing History of the Jesuits there. He was an Italian. He fled Italy and uh, took up residence in England and warned the English people of the Jesuits going to overthrow England and the British Empire. And, of course, very few of them listened. And, but he wrote his great work, History of the Jesuits, there from London. So all these priests, and there are many hundreds of them, have written works exposing the Jesuits, the duplicity of the Vatican, the Pope's temporal power, assassinations and murders, and they have use their secret societies like Skull and Bones and like the Knights of Columbus and high-level Freemasons in academia to suppress these books. I never forget when I went to a book sale at a major university around here, and I found 50 years in the Church of Rome for 10 cents. <laughs> the, the, the doctrines of Pius IV for 25 cents. I found 50, I found a Pope Repousism and Jesuitism, one of the greatest masterpieces written by an ex-priest, on the power of the Jesuits ever written, written in the late 1800s, founded for 75 cents. So they have deliberately purged the libraries of the greatest works, of the greatest exposés on them, because they don't want any you know, honest, critical thinker to evaluate them. And I remember the interview we did a, a while back with uh, former Archbishop of Guatemala, Gerard Buffard. The bishop. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this was another example. Now, he was a liaison between the black pope and the pope, and he verified everything in, you know, that you, we talked about and added some of the things, uh, you know, very credible. He lives in Canada, and, and I've tried to get him on the show, but he's very ill. And he's I know, ill, he's I, Ill, but as I mentioned to you, he said he won't come back because he was told by some intelligence people up there to shut your mouth, and you're not going to go back on that show anymore. So that's why he won't right. come back. Yeah. And so you know, remember, British, uh, Canadian intelligence, uh, Canadian secret intelligence service, CSIS, uh, is nothing but a tentacle of the CIA. And so they do what they're told from Washington. Same way with the FBI, same way with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They're all a tentacle of the Vatican, 
And anybody who seriously has, who has any credibility to come out and expose this, they are told to shut their mouths. Right, and I remember he brought some interesting information verifying uh, much of what we talk about, about the Jesuit order's intentions, the Vatican role in the New World Order, and uh, this comes from the mouth of an, a former Archbishop of Guatemala, uh, who I might add uh, is now a uh, born-again Christian. That's right, he had and, uh, mm -hmm. he and was when I was there to visit him a couple years ago, he showed me his broken bishop's ring, because whenever a man ceases to be a bishop, they break the ring open, they take out a, a certain a seal that's in it, uh, but he showed me his broken bishop's ring. He'd been in the Knights of Columbus. He had the sword, the outfit, the whole thing with the Knights of Columbus. He'd been inducted into high little high level Freemasonry within a certain Catholic cathedral up there. He showed me all right. his regalia and all his uniforms. Yeah. Yeah, and he mentioned uh, that he was in the higher uh, higher level Freemason, and that's that right. many archbishops are around the world. That's right. Uh, and then he's threatened. So what does that tell you, folks? If a guy is so, so credible as him is threatened and can't come on the show again, don't you think there's an ounce of credibility in what we're talking about? And don't you think there's a really reason for why they want to blame the Jews and why they want to keep this message off? Because this is really how you're going to destroy the New World Order, and they don't want anybody to know about it. Because I tell you what, look what happened to Kennedy. We talked about that earlier. And there's another interview I remember. There was a guy named Jim Arabito who had done a lot of the, uh, exposing in the 90s of the Jesuit order, and he was on a world mission to expose this. In fact, I pulled an interview that he did with uh, Father uh, uh, with uh, Alberto Rivera, a former Jesuit priest who was killed by them, and uh, it's just uh, enlightening information that's been suppressed in the... Uh, as the, as the Jesuits would have it, Jim Arabito uh, was killed in an Alaskan plane crash when he was on his uh, mission to expose these people. Uh, another right, the same person. way they did the John Jr. JFK yeah. Jr. Sure, you think wanted, so? Huh? Wanted to find his father's killer. He had a hundred million dollars to spend. He was definitely a threat. They killed Kennedy just like they killed James Arabito. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and I, I remember I, I've also had Nuri Rivera on, and that's uh, Father Alberto Rivera's wife, who talked about how she's been threatened by the Jesuits and verifies the story that he was killed because of his uh, exposition of the Jesuit order and the things that we talk about. So it's there being covered up in uh Hopefully, my only hope is that many more people do some research and begin to expose this in many more places on the Internet. And uh, my hope is that someday we'll see it in the mainstream media because that will be the sign that our country is getting healthy again. Eric, I know you wanted to talk about how to, how to confront these people, how to successfully uh, live in this type of world, and what to do to, in a sense, try and defeat this Vatican-led New World Order. And I wanted to go over with, because we uh, tried that last time, and we didn't get through it all. And I know you had a lot more to say about that. So go How ahead. How much time we got, Greg? About another 40 minutes or so? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, just as a recap a little bit, we have to remember the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages, before the Jesuits existed, was run by the papacy. The top orders were Franciscans, Dominicans, Benedictines, Augustinians, etc. And the papacy was running papal Europe, and uh, they had an inquisition that ran in throughout all the nations in Europe. That was their international intelligence community. It was the holy office of the inquisition. And when anybody was ever uh, accused, secretly accused, they were the accused was not were not allowed to see their accuser. Whenever they were secretly accused of saying anything bad about the Pope or bad about one of the kings that the Pope was using to rule that country, they would be arrested at night. The Inquisitor, dressed in red, would bang on the door, and then people would come to the door, who is it? The Holy Office. And, st and struck with fear and terror, the door would slam open. It would grab the person, the man of the house, arrest him, take him down, and torture a confession out of him. And now once he confessed to his crime, like the Russian KGB or NKVD, then they handed him over to the secular arm to be burned. 
After that, they confiscated all of his wealth and all of his landed property. So the Inquisition today, uh, through the Black Pope's International Intelligence Community, works the same way. Uh, and the IRS is a part of that. And this is what the Jesuits have sought to do, to restore the blessed despotism of the Dark Ages. And there's a book called The Thirteenth Century, The Greatest of Centuries. And in it, these Jesuit uh, coadjutors call for the restoration of the 13th century when the Pope is the universal monarch of Europe. And that's exactly what they want to do now. And so what happened is uh, they, they had this power where you had the immorality of the Vatican, the mass murder going out throughout Europe for several hundred years, and all of a sudden God raised up a man, a few men, Wycliffe, Martin Luther, William Tyndall, John Calvin, and a few others, who believed the gospel. Jesus Christ had died for their sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again and coming back, 1 Corinthians 15, and that they were the champions of justification by faith alone, not by any works of righteousness which we would do, but by the simple grace of God that we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. The gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. And when Luther realized justification by faith alone, through grace alone, and the scriptures were the final authority of faith and practice, he said, there's no more need for the Pope. There's no more need for the papacy. And ultimately he was expelled from the papacy because it rejected the word of God, and he became the great German uh, reformer out of which the rest of the reformations took place, like in Holland and in England. And uh, what happened with this Protestant Reformation when the Bible was put into the hands of the common man in his own language. He could now read what God's maxims and, and uh, his words for himself. And so in applying these maxims to everyday life, why these northern European nations broke the temple, the political power of the Pope over their nation after they had broken his spiritual power by believing on Christ, the one mediator between God and men, according to 1 Timothy 2.5. So with the breaking of his temporal power, we now have what's called national sovereignty. There was no national sovereignty in the Dark Ages. If the king did not do what the pope told him to do, the pope would relieve his subjects of their allegiance to him. And the first one that could get near him and kill him would be doing God a service. So there was no national sovereignty in the Dark Ages, but now with the pope's temporal power broken, why national sovereignty begins in Germany it goes into Holland after an 80-year civil war. It goes into England with Elizabeth and later Cromwell. And it also finds its way over here with the creation of our Declaration of Independence and U.S. Constitution. Uh, with all the colonies were historically white Anglo-Saxon, Presbyterian, and Baptist Calvinists, 97% of them. And so what we have is the modern era taking place after the uh, 30 years' war ending in 1648. And so with the modern era taking place and national sovereignties arising and a middle class with its own money arising using gold and silver coins or currency redeemable and such, because all the nations had gold and silver coins, Europe and here, uh, what you had then was prosperity, you had a middle class, you had inventions, you had science, you had advancement of civilization like it had never advanced before, far beyond the Renaissance, all because... People embraced the Word of God, the Reformation Bible, for English-speaking people in the A.B. 1611, or if you please, the Geneva Bible. It comes from the same essential Greek text. And with that, the blessing of God was on those peoples, and that exalted their nations. And that's exactly what Proverbs says. Righteousness exalted a nation. Well, how much more righteous can you be is when God looks at you and he sees his son. And when you obey his word and keep his commandments, then your nation, your community, your home becomes prosperous, and you begin to excel. Well, the Jesuits cannot have this. So what we must do is we must destroy the very foundation of this historic white Anglo-Saxon Western culture born out of the Reformation. So what we're going to do is we're going to wage war. We're going to cause wars between these Protestant nations like England and Germany. We'll get them to war and kill each other, and we'll... we'll uh, we will take the Bible out of their hands. We'll split counterfeits in the hands of these people. All come from uh, the Revision Committee of 1870, uh, the West Cotton Horde Greek text, which is really pro-Jerome's Latin Vulgate Greek text. And we're going to make all these different translations of this corrupted Greek text 
and we're going to flood England, and we're going to flood America with it. And we're going to call it the American Standard and the New American Standard and, and NIV and goes on and on and on. And so with that, the people have ignorantly departed from the Word of God because their pastors are hirelings. They're not real pastors. They're not real men of God because men of God will die for the sheep. They don't care as long as they're being obedient. And so now the Jesuits have replaced the Bible with a book called the Bible, which it's not. And then they get control. Once they break the spiritual power of the nation, like they broke our spiritual power here in America by 1900, they took over the government. And once they took over the government, the Pope's temple power was in place, and then they will execute canon law. So what did they do? They used America and the British Empire and the, and the German government to wage wars on populations that they wanted to see destroyed, as well as their own populations. And so where we are now is we are at the lowest ebb of the Reformation that I've ever seen in its history, and I've, we're at the greatest pinnacle of Jesuit power that we've ever seen. So what is the answer? The answer is we've got to do exactly what our forefathers did. That's the only way we'll break their spiritual power. No atheist is going to do it. No Muslim is going to do it. No Roman Catholic devoted to the Pope is going to do it. And no Jew is going to do it. It's going to take men who truly repent of their sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again and coming back. And now you're placed in Christ, and now you have power as you're reading the Bible to resist Satan's government and his greatest second cause, which is the papacy. Now that you're in this position, you have to enter into a solemn league and covenant, as the covenanters did in Scotland with one another. We begin to form our own churches, like the Szymanskis, or the Phelpses, or the, or the Hugheses, or the Eberhards. You know, we're going to be new denominations, God forbid. But we're going to have our own churches, and as we will then unite together with, under a common league uh, fellowship, under a solemn league and covenant, and we will covenant together with one another to protect one another, to look out for one another, and to not go along with the tyranny of the government, which leads to the next conclusion. And that is formal and open secession by us once we are right with God, because you see, God has established the divine institution of human government. So therefore, what we have to do is we then, once we have to declare our sovereignty and establish our own human government, and then tell to the world why we are declaring our sovereignty as the Declaration of Independence did, so that we have a just cause, a righteous cause, for declaring our sovereignty and independence from Washington and the American Empire and starting our own nation states once again in this North America. And so what, what examples do we have? Well, we have the example of the Presbyterian Calvinists of Mecklenburg County in North Carolina. And I read to you from um, the Council of Charleston, it's uh, November of 1986. On page 17, we read, quote, Relationship between the Declaration of Independence and the Mecklenburg Declaration. Did Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence without borrowing from another major document that also declared separation from Britain? There is much evidence that Jefferson borrowed from the Mecklenburg Declaration when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. On May 20th, 1775, one year before the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia, the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, met in Charlotte to declare their independence from the government of Great Britain. The following is a portion of this Mecklenburg Declaration. Before I read that, I'd just like to comment here. These guys had guts. And the reason why they had courage is because they had faith. And the reason why they had faith is because God imparted that faith to them in the reading of the Reformation Bible, the King James Bible, or the Geneva Bible. And because of their courage and faith, listen to, they, they just took a mere county, a mere county, and declared their independence from King George III and his huge Royal Navy. Here's a portion of that Mecklenburg Declaration. Quote, We do hereby dissolve the political bands which have connected us with the mother country, and hereby absolve ourselves from all allegiance to the British crown. We hereby declare ourselves a free and independent people, are and of right ought to be a sovereign and self-governing association, under control of no power other than that of our God, 
and the general government of Congress, to the maintenance of which we solemnly pledge to each other our mutual cooperation and our lives and our future and our most sacred honor. That's where Jefferson got that in the Declaration from the Mecklenburg Declaration. So this is what these men do, and if they did it then, Greg, we can do it again. God doesn't change. If we honor him, he'll honor us. If we keep his commandments, he will honor us. He will answer our prayers. There's no reason why he could not bless a movement like this. But it will take men who are completely devoted to the, to the true word of God and to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they have no affinity to any particular denomination. Their affinity is to right teaching and the doctrines of grace as found in the Bible. And when they do that, the revolt, the true healthy revolution will begin in the pulpits, and that will carry over into the political, civil life of a people. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, that, that plan, it, I mean, I, it sounds to me like the only way to, uh, to get this, uh, to, to do what you're saying is to follow what people did in the past, and it seemed to work. It worked because the Lord intervened. See, they weren't like posse comitatas. They weren't like the Ku Klux Klan. They weren't like all the identity people. They weren't calling for you to get your guns and fight the government. What these guys did is they first got right with God. They had a public confession of sin in Scotland with the Covenanters. That was their example. They took the Westminster Confession of Faith. It was the, it was the guideline for the Mecklenburg Declaration. And then once they were right with God, then they openly declared their purpose by by withdrawing their allegiance to King George and reserving it only to the Congress, and then God blessed them with righteous men to lead them and, and men of faith and courage to fly, fight on the battlefield against these tyrants when they sent their armies against us. Hmm. And well, well, maybe Here's another thing, too. Have, have, this would be tantamount to, say, in Pennsylvania here, the county that I live in is Lebanon, that Lebanon County declares its independence from Washington. And no, that, it's not, that, yeah, go ahead. that go it's ahead. only that it will sub submit to the leadership of Harrisburg. Okay? So we're not totally lost. We're on the part of our state. So we're helping our state. We're urging our state to do what we did in our county of Lebanon. And then after Lebanon, then Berks. And then after Berks, Lancaster. And then pretty soon all these counties begin to secede. And then there's a movement in Harrisburg in Congress there for a ordinance of secession. The Pennsylvania is withdrawing from this empire. Okay, Eric, let's take a three-minute break, come back, and talk some more. This is Eric Dunfeld, Jeff, the short Okay, we're back on the Investigative Journal. My guest is Eric John Phelps. He's the author of Vatican Assassin III. And we're discussing uh, some solutions to the problem instead of always trying to uh, just talk about the problems. And, Eric, I think one of your, your major points is you must have a strong faith, and then you must uh, begin to declare your sovereignty uh, from this go illegal government that we have uh, now have controlling us. Uh, for many, many reasons, I think uh, this is similar to what happened back in the 1700s. But what are the differences? What, how do you see this, if this ever did uh, move forward, what are the differences in modern-day America, maybe bigger obstacles we have to We have no uh, preachers. Cross. We, we have no preachers. We have no men of God with courage. And that's what the colonists had. We, the, the preacher there at Lexington... He wouldn't let his men out there. They were the ones who died in the green. He led his, all of his men in church to fight the Redcoats. And until we get over this brainwash of Romans 13, that it is a defense for unlimited submission to tyranny, until we repudiate that heresy and start to go back to what it really means and that God instituted human government for our benefit and that they bear the sword for our punishment for evil and they are to reward us for doing good, when that, when that kind of biblical government is acknowledged, and that's why government wasn't established, then we can go forward. But it's going to have to start in the pulpits. Therefore, what God's going to have to do, he's going to have to start saving some of these men that are listening on this broadcast, uh, giving them the faith of Jesus Christ, and they're going to read the Bible for themselves, and they can start their own preaching. They can start preaching out on the street or at universities or whatever, and you know what? One, one day they'll get a following. And then as they become more influential and they start preaching and they put out a newsletter, 
But they are fearless preachers. They have no fear of the government. They have no fear of anybody or anything. And as they're beginning to preach, then people start to wake up. And as they wake up, now your county has woke up, and ultimately you run for election. You, one of your church members becomes the sheriff. Another guy becomes the county commissioner. And then pretty soon you get these guys in places of government, and then you decide to withdraw your allegiance to Washington. And remember, the sheriff's the most powerful law enforcement officer of the county. Once that declaration of independence is made, then you kick out all the federal agencies. All of them are gone. Because now you have a sovereign county, and you're calling for Harrisburg or your state capital in your state to, to declare its independence from Washington. And once and that sheriff, happens, uh, you, you now yeah. repudiate the national debt. You now take all the land, all the property that's, that's, that's really um, been pledged to the Federal Reserve because of the national debt. You take it back. You've taken back your land. You've taken back your pr personal property rights. You reinstitute the common law. You let people prosper. Inventions begin to happen. And uh, with that, people begin to prosper. Begin, people begin to be optimistic. Doctors to come into your country where they can cure cancer and they can cure heart disease. There's no reason anybody should have those things. And so once you do that, you have freedom of expressions, freedom of invention, and you're going to see leaps and bounds growing in culture and progress. Well, the Jesuits don't want this. So what does that mean? We have to prepare for our defense. Every man must be armed. And we have to be willing to die for the sake of our God and for the preservation of our nation and keeping it sovereign. And it might be a little low state of Vermont, or it might be the state of Maine, or it might be the state of Tennessee. But there's got to be some place somewhere here in North America county by county, that they will begin to secede. And I can't think of any more of a reason than this horrible crime of bringing down the World Trade Center, the crime of killing Kennedy and never resolving the murder, and now the crime of using our young people to fight this Pope's crusade on a war of annihilation that ultimately is going to kill our military because it will be betrayed. We need to first repent, get right with God, establish our own government, and then secede. And... Uh... Yeah, anything else you want to add on this? Um, yes, there's a book that your listeners need to get a hold of. It's called Lex Rex by Samuel Rutherford. And uh, Samuel Rutherford was a Bible-believing preacher. He was hated. His work was publicly burned by the agents of Rome in England because this great work was the foundation for, for resistance to political tyranny, and he names the Jesuits throughout the book as the masters of usurping the government of England. So we need to read Lux Rex, we need to read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and we need to read the Reformation Bible and look back into our histories. Turn off the TV, it's nothing but Jesuit cinema and lies, and get back into the truth, which will take work. Yeah, and uh, there's uh, we, the obstacles to uh, seem insurmountable, I think, met people that would be listening... Uh, but you know what? I'm listening. Do you know what, Greg? That's exactly what God likes. He likes it when the odds are all against us. I think of Joab when he said to to uh, on the battlefield, he said, uh, uh, "You go there and I'll go here, and let the Lord doeth what seemeth good to Him." All that matters is that we are in a position of obedience where we're obeying God, and let the Lord doeth what seemeth good to Him. I think of uh, Latimer, Ridley, and Fry that were burned at the stake at Smithfield. And one of those men, I believe it was Fry, as he was condemned and they were leading him to the stake, he, he stopped and he kissed all seven or eight of his children, every one of them goodbye by right. their age, and then went to the stake and was burned. I mean, if these guys can die for the gospel of Christ and kiss their children goodbye, how much more should we be able to do the same thing in seeking to to make a place where our children can have a chance, because there's not a prayer for them now. They have no future ahead of them. That's a point that we need to discuss, yeah. The, the, what's the fate of our children in the next generation if we don't try to do something? Uh, I think you're right. They don't have a chance. And, I, you know, you've said some really good things, and I think I wanted to just uh, add something, and that is if we look at all the patriot movements, Many of the movements that have tried to uh, secede from the Union, uh, there are many different ones. They're all lacking uh, what I think you, what you, you touched on, and that is faith and men of conviction uh, who are not just operating out of, out of a secular mind state. That's right. They have no personal righteousness. 
They haven't been declared righteous according to the scriptures. And therefore, they have not subordinated their will to the word of God. Because you see, it's first the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's what we submit to. And we're cut by it. And as we're cut by the sword of the spirit, God begins to remake us into something he can use. And then after we're in a position where we have been fashioned, where we can be of service to the Lord, and we, where the sin is cut down in our lives to the place where we're not constantly involved in sin, then he can begin to use us for these kinds of things. And that's where all the Patriot Movement boys, uh, they're all lacking because they have no personal righteousness. It's not a biblical position founded in the Bible and based on the history of the Reformation. And it can never yeah. work. And what, they, what happens is they concentrate solely on the secular aspect without completely understanding what the New World Order is all about. That's right. It's tying in the Jesuit Vatican connection and the Inquisition uh, to the same movement that was happening uh, you know, back in uh, the uh, days we're talking about revolution in this country. And so I think what you're getting at here, and I, I think I, I could make the statement, maybe that's the reason that many of these patriot movements have been unsuccessful, and that's why people that look upon this now will say, well, look at all the people in the past that have failed. Well, and they're, they're, in the patriot missing. movement, there's not one of them, because I was yeah. a part of some of them. I was yeah. a member of the National Quality and Barter Association, Golden Mean Society, a whole bunch of patriot organizations. Every last one of them are anti-Jew. Every one of them. So God's right. not going to bless them. Genesis 12 is going to come into play. I'll bless those that bless you, the seed of Abraham, and I'll curse those that curse you. So you're going to curse the racial Jews? God will not get involved in what you're doing. That's what Tex Mars is doing, cursing the racial Jews. So now he has no, he doesn't have God's blessing in his ministry. So we have to get away from that Jesuit sidetrack, that Jesuit rabbit trail, realizing there are many evil Jews, but like Larry Silverstein, who made billions of dollars uh, because of 9-11, but he's a servant of the Archbishop of New York. We have to call these Jews the Pope's Jews, and they're servile to the papacy. They have no king but Caesar, which is the Pope. But once we get our right. doctrine right, and we realize who the true enemy is, which is the Vatican, and especially the Jesuit order, which is the power behind the Vatican, then we can petition our God, and he will intervene for us, and he will begin to answer our prayers. Because, you see, we now have personal righteousness. And as we're cleansed by the washing of the water by the word of John 15, he's in a position to answer our prayers. If our prayers are pursuant to his will and we want something good and not something selfish for ourselves, he'll answer them. He'll intervene. He'll, he'll, he'll sow a confusion in the hearts of the enemies. He'll kill the leaders that are the most powerful. You know, God will begin to intervene for us. And that's what the Jesuits don't want. That's why they teach us to be atheists in the schools. That's why they've taken the Bibles out of public schools. That's why they make uh, uh, infidels out of all your top uh, academians and scientists. You have to imbibe in them. There is no God, so don't waste your time praying because uh, nothing's going to come of it anyway when history is completely contrary to that. Right, and I think if you added that one aspect, the spiritual aspect you're talking about, to a patriot movement, I think people would be surprised how quickly the numbers would grow. That puts the movement into warp, warp drive. Would, We're just yeah, puddling along. The, when you want to put it in warp drive, it's got to be done with the Bible and the power of the Spirit of God. Then it goes warp, and then they can't catch you, and then God begins to protect you, and he sows confusion in their camps, and it's just wonderful. I, I, you know, I, I saw that in the Dutch Republic. I saw it in the American uh, 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 War of Independence. I saw it in Cromwell on the battlefield at Dunbar and Marston Moore. God intervening. That's the only solution. When, when the Spanish Armada was sunk, when England was fixed after five days of battling, the Clippers had run out of ammunition and food, and, and uh, there was no one to save them. Then God sent a storm and wiped out two-thirds of the Spanish Armada, killing 20,000 soldiers, and only 10,000 returned to Spain. God will intervene for it. I'm telling you, we're getting a Chinese invasion. They're going to send their huge navy that's been built by the Knights of Malta using our corporate uh, uh, cartel capitalists. They're going to invade our country. And you know what? I say, said at the Con Con in 2002, if we would repent, if just God's people would repent and begin to start reading his real Bible, the AB 1611, and calling upon him in faith and resisting these sinners in our government as well as foreign uh, policy, God would intervene for us. The only thing we have to fear is not obeying him. We have to count our lives. We have to count all things but loss 
Dying is nothing. It's easy to die. It's hard to live for the Lord. It's easy to die. So when they put a bullet to our heads or the, whatever happens, it's easy. It's home to be with the Lord. The hard part is sticking around and doing what's right. And the Lord will intervene, just as he did in the past in those examples. And that's why I wrote Vatican Assassins, to give you a flow of history, how God intervened for these peoples, these poor peoples, who trusted him and who committed their lives to him and sought to obey his word, and he intervened for them and their countries and blessed them for it. Yeah, and I mean, this is another reason why uh, the Jesuits and the Vatican want to keep all this out of the mainstream or the alternative news. Because once this is uncovered, uh, that spirit of God could could really ch change the tide, uh, and I think they know that. That's right. They know it. That's why they hate the doctrines of grace. That's why they hate Calvinism. That's why they hate the idea that man is totally depraved. That man is a, a, that needs irresistible grace to come to salvation. That Christ's death in a specific way was for His elect that there is an irresistible grace that God gives to call you to salvation. And when you're saved, there's a perseverance of the saints. They hate the concept of the total depravity of man. They think man is basically good, and by reason they can know God, etc., etc., etc. And so, therefore, they don't believe that man is a, an innate and corrigible sinner. They hate that doctrine, because when a man gets that in his soul and realizes he can do nothing without Christ, then God, when you know you can do nothing, then God begins to work through you. And great things happen. And the Jesuit orders put to flight. For example, in England, the Jesuits had taken over King George III. He'd be protected uh, after Jesuit General Ritchie uh, died in uh, St. Angelo Castle in Rome. He protected the Jesuits in England. And so we're not surprised to see the Jesuits controlling uh, King George III uh, during the American War of Independence. But God intervened. He used the French, who had expected to help us. They sent their navy over to us. They'd sent Lafayette to us, the boy general who, who dearly loved General Washington, and Washington him. And as a result, God used France and Spain to give us victory and separation from England because Spain had suppressed the Jesuits, and so had France. So God can do it again if we would but trust him and seek his face and not be willing to do what ultimately we must do, and that is to go to the block if we have to for the sake of the truth. Right, and those, those points, uh, you know, and that, so I think is really an inspirational uh, speech that you just gave because it gives uh, many people out there uh, who have found the Word of God a reason to uh, look at the secular aspect of this and work together. And for those who are struggling to find truth or faith, to uh, see how important it is to have th that faith and to get it from God, uh, and to see how the Vatican and Jesuits have been manipulating both aspects. The right. religious aspect. Because, you, there was a movie right. out. It was uh, Clint Eastwood, and it was called uh, the, the Pale Rider. Mm -hmm. We were listeners of Seen Heard It. And in that movie, the evil, wicked man who's in charge of the miners that are destroying these other guys that had their little mines, their little gold mines, when uh, it's reported to him that this preacher's in town, he said, not a preacher! He says, if a preacher is there, those people are going to have faith. And then we'll really be in trouble. That's exactly what the Jesuit orders think. If a true preacher comes around and people start getting saved and starting to live by faith, then the powers of tyranny have a real problem. And they express right. it in that movie. Yeah. yeah, I remember that, too. I remember that movie. Uh, yeah. I, I watched it maybe even within the last six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when you see that, when you see that, when you see, then you look at the social aspect of America, and I think people, uh, once we've talked about the, the religious and the, and the secular points here, look at the social aspect of America, what we've turned into as a culture. Uh, and isn't it exactly what the Jesuits wanted? No faith whatsoever, a total uh, group of people who live, uh, you know, the high life, uh, watching TV, entertainment, pornography, right. you know, it goes on and on and on, and what that does is it keeps you, it keeps you away from the important things in life. And I just wanted you to comment about their social aspect, the That's social exactly plan right. they have. For exactly. the They've used their Supreme Court to legalize pornography, to legalize forced race mixing, which is completely unbiblical. 
They've used it to exalt the female to an equal level as a man, which is really female supremacy now. If you don't believe me, just watch what happens when you get a divorce and see who gets what. They have completely reversed everything. They have destroyed our monetary system. We have no wealth. We can't save a dime. They've given us lousy. They've destroyed our domestic manufacturers. They've destroyed our small businessmen that was the basis for all of our jobs and having fine American products. It's one damnable thing after another. And so the people think, who cares? There's nobody who cares. Give me another shot of whiskey or give me another hit on that joint or let's go do an eight ball. And so as a result of all this depression, that's the practical solution. But the practical solution when you embrace the Word of God is it doesn't matter how dark it is. Because no matter how dark it is, the Lord's still on the throne. He still has all power in heaven and earth. And he can intervene and answer your prayers and when he does that with a host of people, things start to happen. Yeah, and I think you're, you know, just so people know you a little bit, uh, uh, you weren't always this way. I mean, no. you, you come from a different background, so I mean, raise it can happen to you, it could happen to anybody. Tell us a little That's bit right. about your background. If it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. I was raised in a little place called Terra Hills, California. Uh, I was raised around Irish and, and Portuguese and Italian Catholic people. Loved them dearly. Yeah, but in my family, we were atheists. And, uh, I mean, we were apostate Protestants. We were once Protestant, but, you know, Jesus is just a good man, blah, 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 blah. And so uh, I was in tremendous sin, even in high school. And, uh, and uh, as a result, the Lord used that sin that I had gotten into to convict me that I was going to hell. And I knew if there was a hell, I deserved to go there. And so, therefore, if there was a hell and I deserved to go there, well, then I needed God's remedy. And his remedy was his son has stepped up, and he died as though he did all those horrible things that I did. And he was buried and rose again, and now he's given me a free pardon. He, he offers a free pardon, and I, the Lord convicted me that that's exactly what I needed. I needed to be forgiven of my sins. And when that happened, the Lord saved me, and he began to change me. And uh, I began to grow in his word and went into the Air Force and uh, spent five years there. And so, but, but it's been a learning process and a growing process, but the, but the benchmark is the point of salvation when you believe the gospel. And if God can save an atheist living around other atheists, then he can save uh, anybody else for that matter. And what would you say to people that would still have doubt, <coughs> excuse me, that would say to you, Eric, how are you so sure? You could, have, you could have taken the easy way out and just dismiss this and go, well, it's just a story, heaven and hell, this, this God. And you could have gone on your merry way, finding many, many different religions and ways of life. Uh, how could you tell a person that you're, you're, you're fairly positive or positive that you chose the right way? Well, simple, Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. When you begin to hear the Word of God, and as you read it, there's something that that book does to you. I was saved in my room, reading, it, reading the book Gospel of John late at night one night. My mother thought I was going crazy, even that Bible. And when I was beginning to read that and I saw that, you know, for God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, when I realized that I needed to, that I had to have the forgiveness of sins, I knew that I was going to hell, and I knew it was true. God gives you the faith to believe. The faith cometh by hearing. It comes to you. By how? By preaching of the Word of God. And the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, temperance, patience, patience, meekness, faith. Faith is the fruit of the Spirit. I have full confidence that if you sit down and you read the King James Bible, starting with the Gospel of John and then going to Romans, something will happen to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, God will begin to get a hold of your heart on these matters. Because it's his supernatural revelation, and God gave his word, he preserved it, and it's ready for us to read in 2007 tonight. If he hasn't right, preserved not... his word, he can't hold the world together. Uh, it's all a farce, and we might as well go out, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Yeah, and in a, in a world like America, where most of the preachers have been corrupted, and we've presented much documentation on this show about that, uh, many people are out uh, going around to different churches and looking and finding and hoping. Uh, what do you got to lose? Read the, read the Bible. Read that version of the Bible, like Eric says, King James Version, John and Romans. And uh, what do you got to lose? Uh, when, when you really think about it. Time. And you may have something really great to gain. 
by opening up your mind and allowing that, even though I know many people get turned off when they hear that word because of the propaganda that's, that's been spread about the that's Bible. That's exactly right. You've got the Jesuits and their coadjutors, the Phelps family. You know, they have to endure that plague of having the same name they have. Because what do they say? All those people in the world share were wicked sinners and they all went to hell and they all deserve to go to hell. But there's no. How do they know that? How do they know there were some people in that World Trade Center that were saved and knew the Lord? How do they know that? What this is, it's a Jesuit design to harden people against those of us who read the Bible and the history of those who read the Bible so that you won't read the Bible. That's what it's designed to do. Yeah. And then they get you going in all different directions. That's right. And uh, without, this, without, without including this as one of the directions, that's what I'm getting at. And so many people, uh, really, I, I know, because I, I can listen to people, you know, who respond to my show, and it's just, I just say, well, what do you got to lose? I mean, uh, give it a shot. I mean, <laughs> talking in strict, you know, with American lingo, give it a shot, uh, maybe you'll uh, learn something. Here's, here's uh, an example of history. Let me give you a complete, absurd example of history. We all know of the mutiny on the bounty, right? Right. Um, well, we're never told the rest of the story. With the mutiny on the bounty, the bounty land is in Tahiti. And yeah, those, in it, so squeeze it in. Okay? okay. Okay. And those sailors, they get off in all kinds of sin, and they're starting to kill each other. Well, one of the sailors crawls back into the hold of the bounty and finds the Bible, and he starts reading it. And then he starts, and he gets saved. He starts reading it to others. And in 20 years after the bounty, the English arrived there to try to arrest and execute those mutineers, and they found the island was civilized. There wasn't any crime because the Bible was part of its culture. That's Tahiti then. And if it did that to Tahiti, it can do that to any culture. Try to read it. Right. Trust God about it. Amen. Right. And, uh, you know, we have about a minute, and I want to thank you again. Uh, any last words on, uh, on the subjects we were talking about tonight? Well, I, I hope I've tried to cover them clearly and, and dealt from a historical and a biblical position. I sometimes let my emotions carry me away, but I always want my emotions to follow my reasoning. <laughs> so hopefully right. the, the listener will receive the blessing, and my encouragement is to read the Bible. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and shall be saved in thine house. Well, Eric, we're all out of time. Again, thank you, and we'll have you on when you get back from your uh, vacation. Okay? Pleasure to be with you, Greg, and your listeners. Okay, that was Eric John Phelps. Go to VaticanAssassins.org. Uh, you can get Eric's latest book, Vatican Assassins 3, there and read a lot about what we were talking, a lot more about what we were talking about in these.